Today we are going to read a story that was written by a French author. I don't speak French, so I might mispronounce some of the names and some of the words, so I apologize in advance. The other thing I want you to know before we start reading this story is that our main character is not wealthy. She's not rich, but she longs to be rich and to be part of the higher class, which means that there's a, a social class system, a caste system. So the more rich you are, the higher up you are, and the more poor you are, the lower you are. So I want you to think about how you would describe this main character. And there's a twist at the end that is full of irony, and I hope you enjoy the story as much as I do. The Necklace by Guy de Mapoussant. She was one of those pretty and charming young girls who sometimes are born as if by a mistake of destiny into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, which means there was no money given by her family to the groom at the time of their marriage, no expectations, no way of being known, understood, loved, married by any rich and distinguished man, and so she let herself be married to a little clerk of the Ministry of Education. She dressed plainly because she could not dress well, but she was as unhappy as if she had really fallen from her proper place in life. Since with women there is neither caste nor rank, because beauty, grace, and charm take the place of family and birth. Natural ingenuity, instinct for what is elegant, and a supple mind are their sole hierarchy and make of women of the people the equals of the very greatest ladies. Okay. So, I had stated that our main character was not born rich. So, she couldn't dress, you know, in rich clothes. She couldn't be seen with, like, the rich people because she didn't belong to their group. Mathilde suffered ceaselessly. Feeling herself born to enjoy all delicacies and all luxuries, she was distressed at the poverty of her dwelling, at the bareness of the walls, at the shabby chairs, the ugliness of the curtains. All these things which another woman of her rank would never even have noticed tortured her and made her angry. The sight of the little Breton peasant Breton means that she lived in the Brittany district, or the Brittany region of France, who did her humble housework, aroused in her despairing regrets and bewildering dreams. She thought of silent antechambers hung with oriental tapestry, illuminated by tall lamps of bronze, with two small footmen in knee breeches asleep in the big armchairs, made drowsy by the oppressive heat of the stove. So she's wishing that instead of her tiny little apartment, that she lived in a great big mansion full of lots of rooms that could be decorated very richly. A tapestry is kind of like a rug, but you hang it on the wall. And antechambers are just small rooms leading into bigger rooms. She thought of long reception halls hung with ancient silk, of the dainty cabinets containing priceless curiosities, and of the little coquettish perfumed reception rooms made for chatting at five o'clock with intimate friends, with men famous and sought after whom all women envy and whose attention they all desire. So... There isn't any fancy parties or fancy dinners and there aren't fancy and rich people for her to, you know, chat with or to hang out with. 
When she sat down to dinner before the round table covered with a tablecloth used for three days, opposite her husband, who uncovered the soup tureen, which is like a big bowl, and declared with a delighted air, Ah, oh, the good soup! I don't know anything better than that. She thought of dainty dinners, of shining silverware, of tapestry that peopled the walls with ancient personages and with strange birds flying in the midst of a fairy forest. And she thought of delicious dishes served on marvelous plates and the whispered gallantries, which are, you know, courteous and flattering words, to which you listen with this sphinx-like smile, mysterious smile, while you were eating the pink meat of a trout or the wings of a quail. She had no gowns, no jewels, nothing, and she loved nothing but that. She felt made for that. She would have liked so much to please, to be envied, to be charming, to be sought after. She had a friend, a former schoolmate at the convent, who was rich and whom she did not like to go to see anymore because she felt so sad when she came home. But one evening, her husband came home with a triumphant air and holding a large envelope in his hand. There, said he, there is something for you. She, store, she tore the paper quickly and drew out a printed card which bore these words. The Minister of Education and Madame Georget Rampanu requests the honor of Major and Madame Loisel's company at the Palace of the Ministry on Monday evening, January 18th. Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she threw the invitation on the table crossly muttering, what do you want me to do with that? But my dear, I thought you would be pleased. You never go out, and this is such a fine opportunity. I had great trouble to get it. Everyone wants to go. It is very select, and they are not giving many invitations to clerks. The whole official world will be there. She looked at him with an irritated glance and said impatiently, And what do you wish me to put on my back? He had not thought of that. He stammered, Why the gown you go to the theater in? It looks very well to me. He stopped, distracted, seeing that his wife was weeping. Two great tears ran slowly from the corners of her eyes toward the corners of her mouth. What's the matter? What's the matter, he stuttered. By a violent effort, she conquered her grief and replied in a calm voice while she wiped her wet cheeks. Nothing, only I have no gown and therefore I cannot go to this ball. Give your card to some colleague whose wife is better equipped than I am. He was in despair. He resumed, see here, Mathilde. How much would it cost, a suitable gown, which you could use on other occasions? Something very simple? She reflected several seconds, making her calculations and wondering also what sum she could ask without drawing on herself an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally, she replied with hesitation, I don't know exactly, but I think I could manage it with... 400 francs? So francs is French money. He grew a little pale because he was setting aside just the, uh, that amount to buy a gun and treat himself to a little shooting next summer on the plan, on the plain of Nantier with several friends who went to shoot larks there on Sundays. But he said, very well, I will give you 400 francs and try to have a pretty gown. The day of the ball drew near, and Madame Loisel seemed sad, restless, anxious. Her gown was ready, however. Her husband said to her one evening, What is the matter? Come, you have seemed very odd these last three days. And she answered, It annoys me not to have a single piece of jewelry, not a single ornament, nothing to put on. I shall look poverty-stricken. I would almost rather not go at all. 
You might wear natural flowers, said her husband. They're very stylish at this time of year. For ten francs, you can get two or three magnificent roses. She was not convinced. No, there's nothing more humiliating or extremely embarrassing than to look poor among other women who are rich. How silly you are, her husband cried. Go look up your friend, Madame Forestier, and ask her to lend you some jewels. You know her quite well enough to do that. She gave a cry of joy. True, I never thought of it. The next day she went to her friend and told her of her distress. Madame Forestier went to a wardrobe with a mirror, took out a large jewel box, brought it back, opened it, and said to Madame Loisel, Choose, my dear. She saw first some bracelets, then a pearl necklace, then a Venetian gold cross set with precious stones of admirable workmanship. She tried on the ornaments before the mirror, hesitated, and could not make up her mind to part with them, to give them back. She kept asking, haven't you any more? Why, yes, look further. I don't know what you like. Suddenly, she discovered in a black satin box a superb diamond necklace, and her heart throbbed with an immoderate desire, which means an extreme desire. Her hands trembled as she took it. She fastened it around her throat outside her high-necked waist and was lost in ecstasy at her reflection in the mirror. Then she asked, hesitating, filled with anxious doubt, Will you lend me this, only this? Why, yes, certainly. She threw her arms round her friend's neck, kissed her with great emotion, then fled with her treasure. The night of the ball arrived. Madame Loisel was a great success. She was prettier than any other woman there, elegant, graceful, smiling, and wild with joy. All the men looked at her, asked her name, sought to be introduced. All the officials of the cabinet wished to waltz with her. She was noticed by the minister himself. She danced with rapture, which means extremely great happiness, with passion, intoxicated, wildly excited by pleasure, forgetting all in the triumph of her beauty and the glory of her success, and a sort of cloud and happiness made up of this, all this admiration, of all these awkward desires, awakened desires, and of this victory so complete and so sweet to a woman's heart. She left the ball about four o'clock in the morning. Her husband had been sleeping since midnight in a little deserted anteroom with three other gentlemen whose wives were enjoying the ball. An anteroom is a waiting room. He threw over her shoulders the wraps he had brought, the modest wraps of common life, the poverty of which contrasted with the elegance of the ball dress. She felt this and wished to escape so as not to be noticed by the other women who were envel enveloping themselves in costly furs. Loisel held her back, saying, Wait a bit. You will catch cold outside. I will call a cab. But she did not listen to him and rapidly descended the stairs. When they reached the street, they could not find a carriage and began to look for one, shouting after the cabman passing at a distance. They went toward the scene, which is a river, in despair, shivering with cold. At last they found on the quay, or the riverside, one of those ancient nightcabs, which, as though they were ashamed to show their shabbiness during the day, are never seen round Paris until after dark. It took them to their dwelling in the Rue des Martyrs, and sadly they mounted the stairs to their flat. All was ended for her. As to him, he reflected that he must be at the ministry at ten o'clock that morning. She removed her wraps before the glass so as to see herself once more in all her glory. But suddenly she uttered a cry. She no longer had the necklace around her neck. 
what is the matter with you demanded her husband already half dressed undressed she turned distractedly toward him i have i've i've lost madame Fourchier's necklace she cried he stood up bewildered what how impossible they looked among the folds of her skirt of her cloak in her pockets everywhere but did not find it you're sure you had it on when you left the ball he asked yes i felt it in the vestibule of the palace but if you had lost it on the street, we should have heard it fall. It must be in the cab. Yes, probably. Did you take his number? No, and you? Didn't you notice it? No. They looked at each other, thunderstruck. They were shocked, amazed. At last, Loisel put on his clothes. I shall go back on foot, said he, over the whole route to see whether I can find it. He went out. She sat waiting on a chair in her ball dress, without strength to go to bed, overwhelmed, without any fire, without a thought. Her husband returned about seven o'clock. He had found nothing. He went to police headquarters, to the newspaper offices to offer a reward. He went to the cab companies. Everywhere he was urged by the least spark of hope. She waited all day in the same condition of mad fear before this terrible calamity. Loisel returned at night with a hollow, pale face. He had discovered nothing. You must write to your friend, said he, that you have broken the clasp of her necklace and that you are having it mended. That will give us time to turn round. She wrote as he dictated. At the end of a week, they had lost all hope. Loisel, who had aged five years, declared, we must consider how to replace those jewels. The next day, they took the case and went to the jeweler, whose name was in the cover. He consulted his books. It was not I, madame, who sold that necklace. I must simply have furnished the case. Then they went from jeweler to jeweler, searching for a necklace like the other, trying to recall it, both sick with grief and anxiety. They found in a shop at the Palais Royal a string of diamonds that seemed to them exactly like the one they had lost. It was worth 40,000 francs. They could have it for 36. So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days yet, and made they made a bargain that he should buy it back for 34,000 francs in case they should find the lost necklace before the end of February. Loisel possessed 18,000 francs that his father had left him. He would borrow the rest. He did borrow, asking a 1,000 francs of one, 500 of another, five louis here, which is French money, three louis here, there. He gave notes, took up ruinous obligations, dealt with usurers, which are people who lend money at excessive interest rates, and all manner of lenders. He comprised all the rest of his life, risked signing a note without even knowing whether he could meet it, and frightened by the trouble yet to come, by the black misery that was about to fall upon him, by the prospect of all the physical privations and moral tortures that he was to suffer. He went to get the new necklace, laying upon the jeweler's counter 36,000 francs. When Madame Loisel took back the necklace, Madame Forestier said to her with a chilly manner, You should have returned it sooner. I might have needed it. She did not open the case, as her friend had so much feared. If she had detected the substitution, what would she have thought? What? Would she have said, would she not have taken Madame Loisel for a thief? Therefore, Madame Loisel knew the horrible existence of the needy. She bore her part, however, with sudden heroism. That dreadful debt must be paid. She would pay it. They dismissed their servant. They changed their lodgings. They rented a garret under the roof, which is kind of like, living in like a garage 
She came to know what heavy housework meant and the odious cares of the kitchen, which means the hateful, terrible chores. She washed the dishes using her dainty fingers and rosy nails on greasy pots and pans. She washed the soiled linen, the shirts, and the dishcloths, which she dried upon a line. She carried the garbage down to the street every morning and carried up the water, stopping for breath at every landing. And dressed like a woman of the people, she went to the fruit seller, the grocer, the butcher, a basket on her arm, bargaining, meeting with insults, defending her miserable money, sow by sow. Every month, they had to pay off some notes, renew others, obtain more time. Her husband worked evenings, keeping a tradesman's account. And late at night, he often copied manuscript for five sow a page. So sows are kind of like pennies. This life lasted ten years. At the end of ten years, they had paid everything, everything, with the rates of usury and the accumulations of the compound interest. So that means even though they borrowed 36,000 francs, they had to pay a lot more than that back. Madame Loisel looked old now. She had become the woman of impoverished households, which means very poor, strong and hard and rough, with frowsy hair, skirts askew, and red hands, she talked loud while washing the floor with great swishes of water. But sometimes when her husband was at the office, she sat down near the window and she thought of that happy evening long ago, of that ball where she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How strange and changeful is life. How small a thing is needed to make or ruin us. But one Sunday, having gone to take a walk in the champs Elysees to refresh herself after the labors of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman who was leading a child. It was Madame Forestier, still young, still beautiful, still charming. Madame Loiselle felt moved. Should she speak to her? Yes, certainly. And now that she had paid, she would tell her all about it. Why not? She went up. Good day, Jeanne. The other, astonished to be greeted familiarly by this woman of the people, did not recognize her at all and stammered, But, madame, I do not know you. You must be mistaken. No, I am Mathilde Loiselle. Her friend uttered a cry. Oh, my poor L Mathilde, how you are changed. Yes. I have had a hard life since I last saw you, and great poverty, and that because of you. Of me? How so? Do you remember that diamond necklace you lent me to wear at the ministerial ball? What? Yes, well, well, I lost it. What do you mean? You brought it back. I brought you back another exactly like it. And it has taken us ten years to pay for it. You can understand that it was not easy for us, for us who had nothing. At last it is ended, and I am very glad. Madame Forestier had stopped. You say that you bought a necklace of diamonds to replace mine? Yes! You never noticed it then! They were very similar, and she smiled with proud and naive joy. Naive means that she's simple. She's um, not knowing what's going to happen. Madame Forestier, deeply moved, took her hands. Oh, my dear Mathilde, why, my necklace was paste. It was worth at most only 500 francs. So when... Madame Forestier says her necklace was made of paste. It was made of shiny glass. It wasn't made of diamonds. It was fake. What do you think about that ending? <laughs>